twice a bread. Why your mama can be feeling? Go cold, dry short, and see when they me heat it, me heat it. Me who no one come me feel me a feel blue. I go see a ready. Whatever from me put is a cure. Let me cross off for my me a bounty. Eighty teams in nine different countries. So trying to get everybody to figure out what they've got to do and deliver on the same day every month, they are shipping to production every single month. With all of those people in different areas with different cultural backgrounds, I'm working in Norway quite a lot with them, but they have teams in the US, they have teams in Asia, all over the place. And it's very difficult to get everybody on the same page. So that's where I started to focus on scaling Agile. How do, how do we do this slightly bigger? And something I found was that there's a lot of ways that people try and give you and maybe give you an option of a different way to do things. So the first thing I want to note, it, if you can get your hands on the Standish Chaos Report, there's a company in Chicago called the Standish Group who assess projects worldwide. So they, I, I don't know how many projects in what areas of the world they assess. I'm probably, probably predominantly within the US because they're a US company and US people are kind of like that. But um, they, they assess all this data on project management and how the projects went and what sort of techniques were used in building that software. And they kind of found something interesting. They found that 350% is how much projects are more likely to see, succeed with Agile. But it's actually more interesting than that. Small projects, it turns out, it doesn't matter. Small projects are only 32% more likely to succeed. So if you've got a small, small team, three or four people working on something, you can pretty much do whatever you want from a planning perspective and you're probably going to be okay, yeah? Because it's small, it's simple, you're not delivering anything complicated, yeah? And yes, a team with small people can deliver complicated stuff and then you need more structure, but the likelihood, if it's, uh, it's small, you only get a 32% advantage for moving to agility. In general, in specific, it might be different. But if you've got a large project, it's 600%. Think about that in money terms. You're 600% more likely to succeed in a large project. You wouldn't believe the number of people that, people that say to me, if your project's big, you can't do Agile. This proves otherwise. If your project's big, you can't do anything but Agile. Everybody should be doing Agile for large projects. And something that, that, that seems to be a bit weird, kind of backwards, is that delivering less features to your customer gives them more value. That seems a little bit weird. But in the waterfall world, where we do all of our assessment of our features up front, if we create a thousand features, maybe only 400 of those features are useful to the customer. Yeah? So suddenly we've got 60% waste. And of those 400 features, maybe only 50% of that the customer actually uses on a continuous basis. So what do we actually waste? One of my colleagues did an assessment with a bank in the US that thought they were awesome at building software and they thought they were awesome at listening to their customers and building exactly what their customers want. But they did an assessment to see how much of their software their customers actually use by injecting telemetry into their software to see what people were actually doing in it. What buttons were they clicking? When were they clicking them? And what order were they doing it? And which of the customers were doing it? Percent waste in their software delivery cycle. Even getting rid of some of that is hundreds of millions of dollars for, for these big banks with lots of software developers. So it's really important to know exactly what you're building. So waterfall is really not going to succeed in large projects. It actually never has, it just kind of pretended to, that had a bunch of project managers that created a system by which they could change the rules in order to pretend they succeeded, okay? So they would say, we've got a project, we need a million dollars to deliver it. They would get the million dollars, they would fail to deliver, and they would submit a change request to get another million dollars in order to actually finish it. And at the end of the day, it looks like they had a project of a million dollars that was successful and delivered, but actually they spent two million, but it's kind of hidden. 
very dangerous, very nefarious. And one of the key things you need is skilled teams. We've talked about that as well. Getting your skills up, not just uh, uh, process skills, but your engineering skills. You need to be striving for excellence in everything you do. And teams that strive for excellence are over 200% more likely to ship. That's a big difference just in getting those skills. We heard earlier how difficult Capital One is finding it finding skilled people. On average in the UK, I believe it takes three months to recruit one developer. He's looking for 100 developers next year. How much chance does he have of getting that? It's very, very difficult because it's hard to find skilled people. So I really want to talk about kind of four key areas. Is it worth scaling? Should we get bigger, have bigger projects? What can we do instead? Yeah, if we don't want to have bigger projects, what do we do instead? Because we still need to build stuff and ship it. And I'm probably going to mangle this. <laughs> but who, who, can, who can say that for me? Can you say that for me? Adwin Kissy? Yeah. We are presented time and time again by consultants and large organizations. Here is a blueprint for the way you should be able to deliver software. We have created a master plan that will work for you in your organization. They're lying. They don't know it will work for you. They're just taking a guess. And there are actually better ways to approach that so you're more likely to get a good thing. We can use Scrum to scale Scrum. Yeah? You don't have to have anything different. You can just use the tools that we've got. And then I want to talk a little bit about practices for scaling Scrum, for getting bigger, things that, that help. I don't know how much of that we'll get through. And I like to think of all the things I'm going to talk about here as an invitation to a conversation, OK? So if you have questions, shout them out. If you want to put your hands up, that's fine. And I'll try and get as many questions answered as possible in the, in the time that we've got. Uh, but there is some stuff that I want to get through kind of first. So is it worth the cost? What happens if you have one team on a project and you add another team? Do you get twice as much work delivered? That maybe works if you were, I don't know, shifting, shifting bricks from one pile to another. I have one person, I can shift 10 bricks a minute, two people, 20 bricks per minute, maybe, depending if they're on the same strength, all that kind of, yeah, all that kind of stuff. But I've got two teams of eight people who all work together in different ways, and are they going to deliver twice as much as one team? You think so? That's that line. It's actually no, not even, not even, not even slightly close to that in software, because there's all sorts of complexities of working together. If I write some lines of code separate from you, write some lines of code, but we've got to ship them together. Do we have to do more work in order to ship? Yeah, because we've got to get our stuff working together. We might be on the same team. That's easy. You've got a team of people writing 50 lines of code a day and another team of people writing 50 lines of code a day, and two weeks later, you've got to ship one product. It starts to get a bit harder. So it's not that linear progression. It doesn't work that way. It kind of starts to tail off. You start to get uh, uh, less delivered the more teams you add. It's actually about 40% you lose per team you add to a project. So two teams both lose 40% of their time because they've got to integrate their work. Software is complex. Writing code is complex. It's hard. It's hard enough for me to get code to work with the guy I'm sitting right next to, let alone I've got a team in Dubai and a team in London, and I've got to get them to integrate work together. And what you don't want to happen and can happen and often happens is something more like this. You add enough teams and people that it gets so complicated that everybody drowns. And you ship nothing. You start delivering way less. So what can you do instead? Well, you can, you can, you can descale. Don't scale in the first place. If you can take one team and improve their skills, you can deliver twice as much work with still one team. Yeah? Go from a team of amateurs to a team of professionals by training them up 
and get him to understand better how to work together, better how to ship. You've then got a professional team that can deliver software effectively. You'll deliver more. If you can get two professional teams, you're going to deliver more again because they are then working in ways where they deliver effective code. Because I don't, who here writes code? I've written code. How many times have you gone and looked at the code that you've written and gone, who, who changed my code? Who did that? And then you realize it was you. You've even forgotten the crazy, nasty stuff that you wrote previously when you go back to it. It's really, really easy. Most software uh, uh, source control tools have a, a blame feature where you can right click on a file and see who changed all the lines. And 90% of the time it was you when you're looking for somebody to blame. Either we can get away with not doing anything more than just Scrum. Uh, the original title of this session was Big Scrum, All You Need and It's Not Enough. Scrum is not the be all and end all of being able to deliver software. It's a tool in your toolbox, but it is pretty good scaffolding for one team. One team can create software inside Scrum. Even if they're not that great at coding, they should be able to deliver something every month. Yeah, because you make the project smaller, one month projects. But you need more. You need those things that I talked about. We've got mechanical Scrum. I'm just following the rules is mechanical Scrum. So if you go read the Scrum Guide and go do that, I'm following the rules. You've not, you're not embodying the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto to yes. say, and are you know, more likely to deliver for you. Yeah? So just following the rules doesn't get you there. You need the values and principles, and you also need technical excellence. Your teams need to be good. Your software engineers need to be good to get there, to really deliver. And remember, you've, you hopefully, Hopefully, you've got competitors. Why do I say that? Because competitors helps us run quicker. Yeah? Who is the biggest investor to Apple? Anybody know? Microsoft. Microsoft bailed Apple out when they were about to go under because they realized that they were going to lose their biggest chance at getting better themselves. To look at who's doing better, to say, I want that. I want some of that. Yeah? It's hard. You need those competitors. So the only foundation for scaling is professional scrum teams. So not just paying lip service to the, to, to the, to the process, not just having technical excellence and ignoring the, 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 the process, values and principles, all of those things, professional teams. And then you can start scaling once you've got them. So. I want to scale now because I've tried everything else and I just, need, I just need more software delivered. I need to deliver twice as many features, which probably means I'm going to need three teams because two teams doesn't give me twice. I probably need three. What's the biggest blocker to moving? F Anybody here work in an uh, organization with more than 50 developers? Any of you planning on going to work for an organization with more than 50 developers? I see you're a couple of guys up the back. Companies go, grow, especially startups. You get past the incubator stage, you're suddenly in the real world of you've got 50,000 customers all wanting features, and you need to start delivering on the promises that you've made, on the prototypes and initial concepts you've built. We need more now. Yeah? Uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, Flickr. The, the imaging software, uh, they have about 50 guys, and they to de deliver code written by each developer to production 60 to 70 times a day. So they have automation, but they still have 50 guys writing code that all needs to get into production, support those systems, all of those things, testing, everything. And the biggest blocker to changing any organization? Culture. And what, what is culture? Culture is really just the way we currently do things, is your organizational culture. And that's the hardest thing to change because we heard earlier, people don't want to change. People get comfortable. They're in the zone. I've worked this way for 30 years. I, my, the company I'm working with in Norway has been building the single piece of software they're working on for 30 years. And every time you suggest that maybe you could try doing something this way, we've been building software for 30 years. I think we know how to build software. 
Yeah, the old timers saying they know better even when there's not really any evidence of that being actually true sometimes. So we, we, want, to look, we want to look at some way of scaling and there are blueprints out there. There are things you can go buy into um, that, that, that give you a blueprint for how your organization might scale, but should, will that work for you? Should that work for you? Well, there's a couple of things we need to take into account. If anybody's worked in a large company, they'll know cult culture, it's, it's, you can bring people into your company that are all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, want to make change to your organization, and within three months, their brains are dead. Large organizations, um, whatever the company name is, let's say you, you uh, well, one of the companies I work with is a company called Schlumberger, which is a big oil and gas company. That's the big company in Norway. And um, I, I, I call people Schlumberger-fied. They've become part of the organization culture. They had aspirations and vision when they came in, and then it all gets killed. Yeah? If we were to take a company, the company you work in, and put it on a, on a graph to kind of see where you are now, because you kind of need to know where are you now, where do you want to go, and then decide how you're going to get there. Or at least, where, where's my first step down that road? So there's two axes here. People orientated on the left, organizations that are very focused on the people. The people are the most important thing. That's a good thing, but not all organizations are like that, and successful organizations aren't. And then you've got company orientated. The company is everything. The company is the way things go. Possibility orientated is where innovation is. Without innovation, your company can't grow. You need that innovation. And just because you're at the top of this graph doesn't mean you have no innovation. It just means that it's not your main focus, you're not your main thing. So there's kind of four quadrants there where your company might fit, or your organization might fit, or your team might fit. On the top right, we succeed by getting and keeping control. Understand everything that every single person is doing within our organization, and we're going to keep control of that, and everybody does what they're supposed to do at the point in time they're supposed to do it. That's very industrial age thinking, but it's prevalent in the industry. And there's lots of words that you can, you can put in that box that, that mean the same thing. It's all about control all about controlling everybody and telling everybody what to do. Okay, so we've got control. Next quadrant, bottom right, we succeed by being the best. So your company might focus on that. What else is there? Top left, we succeed by working together. So we're people orientated, but in the real world, where we are now. So it's interaction, trust, Synergy partnership. We've not seen anything bad yet. Control's not bad. You maybe need some control. Otherwise, you've just got chaos. And that's collaboration. And the last quadrant in the bottom left, we succeed by growing people who fulfill our vision. That's fully people orientated. And in there, creativity, evolution, things, taking things on faith. We, we know that you're going to do that thing you said you do because you've done a bunch of things before and we have faith that you can do it. All of those things, that's cultivation. We need some of all of this stuff to succeed, but if you were to look at those quadrants and think about the organization that you're in, if, if you, you guys still at university, think about that organization and what it, its values that it pushes to you, where, where, where does that fit in here? You could be in control. If you're in an enterprise, you're probably there. Yeah? But is every company in the same place on that graph? No. It's like a fingerprint. Everywhere, everybody's going to be in a different place. And if you decide to do something to change, let's say you want to go over to where B is, is that place you want to go the same for every company? No because every company has a different leader. It's made up of different components, different people. And is the path going to be a straight line? No, it never is. There's all sorts of bumps and trials and tribulations along the road that are gonna mess up whatever master plan you create. So what you actually end up with is something that looks more like that. We have a vision where we want to go and we take one step this way and we actually ended up over here and we have to figure out, well, we still want to go over there. How do we get the next step through that? Does that sound like a blueprint? 
No, you can't have a blueprint to change your organization. It's not even possible. All the blueprints that are out there are actually based on, we, got, we changed a company, it worked there, here's a blueprint for how they changed their company, a white paper. We're gonna come and apply this to your company exactly the way it is, and then people follow it religiously. And they don't understand why they don't get the value that they should from it. But it's because that was for a different company, with a different culture, going in a different direction to a different place. So why should it work? So it's very important to focus on taking those steps. Understand where your organization is. Focus on where you want to go. And you get that focus by creating a vision. Yeah, you need somebody within your organization to own a vision. We're going this way. This is the way I want everybody to go and start taking steps along that road. And it may take you a long time to go there. Uh, Slomberger has a 11 year plan to get to, they're not expecting to get anywhere near agility within the next 11 years. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. It's hard, it's big, it's hard and it's nasty. So what can we do? We need some sort of framework to help guide us so we don't get lost. We don't want to go off the road, off the rails. So maybe we need some way of taking multiple teams and having them work together a little bit more effectively. Does that make sense? So if you've got one group of people in a team, you're all, all familiar with Scrum, hopefully. What, what have you got? You've got a bunch of uh, uh, developers, team members, You've got a scrum master to deal with any impediments that come up and make sure everybody understands the process. And you've got a product owner who owns the product vision and they're guiding the team via the backlog through to delivering working product. If I've got two teams, eh, I might be able to get away with them just, you know, getting on with it and figuring it out. Yeah, you can just self-organize around that. Three teams. Four teams, five teams, 10 teams, 20 teams, 30 teams. Suddenly you've got 30 teams who all need to talk to each other and you've got a problem. Dependency management is a nightmare when you get to larger types of teams and organizations in software. Think of Office. What do you think of when you think of Office? Do you think of Word? Because Office isn't Word. Office is Word and Excel. And not just Word and Excel, but SharePoint and Exchange Server and all of these other products and Office 365. There's hundreds of people that work on these products. But they all have to work in the same way. They all have to, there is a whole team inside of Microsoft whose sole job is owning the copy paste feature. So that when you copy and paste, regardless of which product you use, whether you're in Excel or you're in Word, or you're on the web, you get exactly the same functionality, exactly the same experience, and it's like you expect it to be. Look at that next time you're copying and pasting between Office, and you'll think of that. You'll think of, oh man, how, how, how can you copy from anywhere and paste into Office, and it kind of works? I mean, most of the time you get roughly what you were expecting. Even pictures, how are you grabbing that information? That's some hard coding, anybody here who's a coder. Complicated, whole team for that. So we maybe need to group, think of a, a scrum team. How big is a scrum team? Six plus or minus three. Between three and nine. You can have teams bigger than nine, but you start to lose communication. So maybe that applies for teams as well. Maybe if we're going to have a bunch of teams working together, that's pro probably the same limitation applies because it's based on communication skills. Like scaffolding around that scrum to help multiple teams talk to each other, but we don't want too much process because then we end up focusing on the process and not on you know delivering software, which is the bit that we want. So what do we have? Uh, Scrum.org has this thing called Nexus. It's the name they're giving it because a Nexus is uh, a communications hub, as it were. And what does that look like? Well, you're familiar with the Scrum diagram. Everybody here familiar with the Scrum diagram? You've got a backlog. Your scrum team picks things or pulls things from that backlog, creates a sprint backlog, executes on it, produces some software, 
you have a review of the software, you have a review of how it went building the software, and you feed that back into the backlog and build more software. Yeah? What, would that, what, would, what might we need if we're going to get bigger? Have you, have you heard of... Uh, so, Scrum of Scrums was an implementation of a concept that didn't really work very well. The concept is team of teams. If I wanted all of you guys to work together, and you at each table all knew each other and had worked together for a while, you guys are used to working together, but now I've got lots of teams who maybe don't know each other. So maybe I need a representative from each team to come together separately, bring the information and culture from that team to a single group, have a discussion about what we're doing, how it's going, what we're going to do, and then feed that back to the teams. That's kind of what a scrum of scrums was. It's a team of teams, maybe temporary, maybe permanent, but it's about creating those communication flows. And we actually need quite a few of them. So in uh, Nexus, they've added a few extra meetings. First, we've got a Nexus integration team, because that's hard. Dependency management, making sure all seven teams ship on the same day in two weeks time, that everybody's code is done, that it's integrated, that it works together, that it's tested. They don't have to do the work. They're this is a facilitation team. They're helping the other teams achieve that goal and making sure they all talk to each other. But we also maybe need a, a bigger sprint planning. Maybe if you guys are the teams that I'm going to work with, I need you all in a room every two weeks together so that we can hash this out and figure out what it is we need to do. What about our daily scrum? We probably need to, because we've got our team's daily scrum, but then what about the wider complexity of dependency management and integrating work? We need that information as early as possible. And then a review. This is hard. I work with a team in Microsoft that does this with about 70 teams. You imagine trying to get 70 teams in a room with, with all the software that they've built over the last three weeks, and we want a review of it. Yeah. A lot of teams use the science fair model, where every, you have a big hall like this, and everybody has a booth where they set up and to show what they've build, built, and the stakeholders come in and go where they care. That works too. Retrospective, we probably have some extra information to share together. Very important. And then our sprint backlog is pretty big because one team maybe can deliver 10 stories, 10 teams can maybe deliver 50 stories. That's a bigger list. And we need a view on that so that we can understand what's going to be delivered. So what does that look like? Well, we've got a Nexus sprint planning at the beginning of the team sprint planning. The teams have to go off and do their sprint planning, and that might take a long time. Because if you've got a team in Singapore and a team in London, they're not going to get up to do their sprint planning at the same time. Because that would suck for one team, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go and do their sprint planning. I, was, uh, I worked on a scrum team um, as the only person in Scotland on a scrum team that was broken up between Sydney and Beijing. Guess who got the raw end of the stick? <laughs> Having to get up at four o'clock in the morning to do a sprint planning meeting. So uh, you've got the sprint backlog, the Nexus backlog, which is all the work that all the teams are doing, but you still need to be able to break it down into team views. Uh, you've got your Nexus daily scrum to take care of the dependencies and feed that back to the individual teams. How are you as a team going to deal with these dependency problems that we've got today? And then we've got our integrated work that we're building. And then we're going to have a review of that software. And it's not a review of what your team's made and then what your team's made. It's one product you've just built that is all integrated and working together. That's the hard part. That's why we have an integration team who are going to help achieve that. Um, and then we've got two ne Nexus meetings, team of teams meetings as part of the retrospective because Stuff happened for the integration team this sprint, yeah? Stuff was hard, maybe we couldn't integrate one team's work because there was some coding issue or some quality issue. That's information that we need to gather together, take that back to the team's retrospective meetings, 
all of you guys individually on tables discuss what it is that you're going to do to solve that. And then the representatives come back together with the integration team to, we're going to go implement this. This is the solutions we've come up with. Because you guys might all come up with different solutions for the same problem. They might all be valid, and then we have to get together, figure out which one's best just now. Communication. It's all about communication, and it's all about people. Getting the right people together at the right point in time to solve the problems. And this is just an ectoskeleton around your scrum teams to help you get together at the right teams. You might need more stuff than this. You might have to do other stuff, but this is the minimum that you need to do to make sure that you're communicating effectively. It's a, a, a continuous integration tool, a build server, that takes, pulls your code from the source repository, builds it, and creates the output. So you want to do that as often and as many times as possible to make sure that what you just put in your source control still works. Because you might have broken stuff. And if you don't find out for six months, you've forgotten why you wrote it that way in the first place. Continuously integrate that. I'm going to talk about that stuff tomorrow. For making sure all of the teams have the skills and knowledge to be able to create, support, and maintain all of those automation systems. Because you can't scale without automation. It's not even possible. If you think about manual testing, anybody here do testing? No, me neither, because I never write bugs in my software, so you know, I don't need to test it. Customers finding bugs in your software is bad. And a bug found in production costs 10 times more to fix than a bug found in development. So you want to be testing your stuff. Even if it's developer A gives you stuff to developer B to go test, you also want to do unit testing. That's automation. Do you guys do unit testing just now? Do you write code? Do you write unit tests? A, a bit? Really? What are they teaching you over there? For you to know whether the code you just wrote does what you expect it to do, is you've got a test that says what it's supposed to do. And do you know what the advantage to having a body of unit tests that says what you, the, proves that the code does what you thought it should do? When I come along three months later and go and edit some of your code to help me do something else, I don't break what you did. Doesn't mean we did anything the customer wanted. Just as long as it does what we wanted, then we're at least somewhere. Yeah. And testing your code actually helps you write better code. It's hard. I hate testing my code. But writing tests for your code actually changes the shape of your code and makes it more testable, supportable, and maintainable anyway. Again, that's an aside from this, but it's part of the work of that integration team. If your team, yes. So the, 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 my question is that wouldn't the integration team be responsible for the testing? Yeah, because you, each developer will do his own unit testing, but the integration team will have to again... Do you know, testing? Yes, exactly. I, I get where you're coming from, and the actual answer is no, the team should be responsible for all the testing. You, there's not going to be enough people on the integration team to do this. This is the problem that, that Slomberger are in right now. They have, they have about 650 people on one product, and they have an engineering team and they have a commercialization team. Commercialization is testing, OK? So if you build stuff over here, these guys can't keep up with what you're building. Then they start to get behind. We get to deadlines. What are you going to cut? We've already coded it. It kind of works. What are we going to cut? We're going to ship anyway. So now we've reduced the quality of our product because we're shipping with technical debt stuff that's not been tested yet. We don't know it really works. And then our customers are going to find bugs, and our, our, our business's reputation is less because the customer then expects bugs in the software. Should have all the members on it you need to ship high-quality working software. That's so testers go on the team. You do need those testers. You do need them, but they should be on the team, inside of the team. So inside of the two-week sprint, Everything you write inside of the two-week sprint is coded and tested and integration tested. Now, that means you have to do automation because if you've got manual testers and you write 30 tests sprint one and then 30 tests sprint two, does that mean we've now got 60 tests to run and we need twice as many testers? And then it multiplies up. So you end up picking and choosing and, again, reducing quality. So if you can come up with a manual test that you need to do, it needs to be automated by the end of the sprint. And if that means you have to deliver less functionality in order to achieve that, because that's more work, that's OK. 
create a sustainable pace where everything you ship works. And then at the end of every sprint, your product owner, your business, is given the opportunity to ship at the end of every sprint. Our shipping think, Windows. Every month, you get a new version of Windows. They've just got rid of their entire, oh, yeah, that's a good one. So Microsoft have just finalized getting rid of all of their test teams. There are no test teams at Microsoft now, none. They just got rid of all the, all the Windows test teams are, are gone now. All the testers now are members of teams. They are part of the engineering teams, and the engine team, engineering teams are responsible for all the testing. So they brought the, high, the really good testers, all came into the teams. The ones that could work in teams were brought into the teams. They have to be coders as well, because making automation for software tends to involve coding. It's not as hardcore coding as building the software itself, but there's a certain amount of coding, and they have to come in there, because without automation, we're not going to be able to deliver. Workshop, because that's about the two. I'm doing a tools presentation tomorrow as well. Because, you know, I'm weird, and I do tools and process. So uh, the most, uh, the thing that will kill any project, even with one team, but more likely with lots of teams, is dependencies. You need to manage your dependencies. That is the most important thing you can look at, dependency management. And that means, are you familiar with vertical stack, not horizontal stack? If you've got software, you maybe have a database, a service layer, and a UI. If you have a team for the database, a team for the service, and a team for the UI, you've just maximized every possible dependency you can have. No team can deliver anything without being dependent on any other team. Yeah? Whereas if you take vertical slices of your software and have a team with all the people you need to deliver all the way through that full stack, you can deliver working software. So dependencies are the most important thing. Working on more than one thing at once is not going to help you deliver stuff. It's going to make, uh, allow you to have the illusion of more work in progress without actually delivering anything. This is from a, a I can't remember the source. Uh, it was a, a consultancy company did a bunch of research. I've had a bunch of customers go and verify this as well because they look at the research and they don't believe it. But if you work on five projects at once, you lose 80% of your time for task switching. You're delivering nothing. You're not ever delivering anything. It's gonna take you 10 years to deliver anything. So work on one thing at once. Finish it, move on to the next thing. In Scrum, you have one sprint underway at once for a team, and the team works only on the stories within the sprint, and I tend to get them to, uh, uh, um, if you prioritize the stories, and let's say you've got six people on a team, I'd say only work on four things at once. Yeah? Four stories at once underway, two people don't have stories to work on, so they have to go help and collaborate. It's kind of mandatory but limiting the work in progress really helps with that and reduces the complexity. Uh, if you want to scale or you need to scale or you have to scale, build awesome teams first, professional teams, and then use those professional teams to start scaling out and building more professional teams. Because you've then got people that understand how to work in that new way and with technical excellence. Like I said, vertical slices all the way through your software. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical to minimize, minimizing dependencies. This reduces 90% of your dependencies just by doing this, which increases your chances of delivery tenfold. Uh, microservices, that's the watchword of the day. Everybody heard of microservices? This is the, the phrase that's sweeping across the states and the UK, and you know, it's one, one of those buzzwords. You ever play buzzword bingo in a meeting? You have a card. Everybody know what bingo is? They call the numbers. So you have a card with all the <coughs> bullshit words that, that are said in meetings, and you stamp them in the meeting when you get all the words, then you can shout. Uh, so microservices are, are all about, see, they thought I was going to swear. All the, micro, the microservices are about breaking down your software into distinct units that can be delivered completely independently. So if you've got a massive piece of software, break it down into lots of smaller units. 
So you're no longer building one big piece of software that's hard to test. You're building lots of little pieces of software that one team can work on and you're not scaling anymore. Because scaling is always bad. Okay, it's always going to be nasty, it's always going to be horrible. Whatever you can do to avoid it is the way to do it. Microsoft are in the process of breaking down all the Office 365 stuff into microservices. Small, independent pieces of software with common interfaces that everybody adheres to that they can ship on a daily basis. Uh, anybody use Azure? Anybody use Microsoft Azure? Yep. So Azure is completely autonomous software, manages it, and they release it to production three or four times a day. So if, if somebody needs a, has a problem with their account, they actually go fix the code and ship a new version of the AI software that manages all the infrastructure. It's pretty insane. Microservices. Uh, organizing development teams, there's loads of different ways to do it. As long as you're organizing, organizing in vertical slices, you're going to have more fun, layers bad. Uh, there was, everybody here builds some sort of software, okay? How do you make sure you keep focus on your customer? Because that, I mean, that, that's, that's important everywhere, but I understood from what people were saying, it's even more important here. You want to keep focus on your customer and get in touch with them, know who they are. One of the tricks that Microsoft uses, uh, that needs to be, you'll get it, it's personas. Have a person who you're building your software for that embodies somebody who uses your software, who has a backstory who has two kids, who has, you know, that you're, you're trying to understand their wants and needs of your users so that you can more effectively build something for them. Because while if you're a small vendor with 50 customers, you can go and talk to your 50 customers. If you're building software, you probably don't have 50 customers. You probably have hundreds of thousands of customers, if not millions of customers, and you can't go talk to them all. So you have to glump, clump them into units that makes sense, who are you going to deliver your software for? Personas is a really powerful feature for that. And use a tool. I know all the Scrum guys will say don't use a tool, don't go near them. However, if I've got 70 teams in nine different countries, I have no choice. If I want to understand what people are working on, if I want to know what's going on, I need the data in a tool. I can't do stickies on a wall anymore. I have a team that kind of tried to do it with stickies on a wall and a camera for their remote guys, live streaming their stickies on a wall all day, every day. And it got to be a nightmare because the guys were always phoning up the office asking them to move stickies around. It just became a nightmare. Get a tool. There are loads of tools out there. This one is TFS, which is the one that I'm going to demo tomorrow because that's the one I like. And it's made by an Agile team. They, they use it themselves because it's Microsoft. They build software themselves. Um, but be able to store, you need to store metadata about your work. You need to understand it from a holistic perspective. Your managers need to understand at the feature and epic and big things you're delivering level, how things are going. And you guys as teams need to understand at the low level how we're executing again. Are we doing good today? In our daily stand-up, are we doing good today or are we not doing good today? We need to go and figure out how to solve that problem. I mentioned it earlier, telemetry. Have telemetry. Make sure you know every button click that your users have. Is there any, any questions? I can always, I'm going to be hanging around. That's what that is, it's the get off. There's gonna be a hook.